I was sitting here watching TV and somebody knocked on the door. It was a captain and a master sergeant. And they were in dress blues and I knew. I just said, no, no, no. that point, it's shock. I don't really even remember reaction. All I can say is no. No. October 6, 2017 was the day I think I went insane. We asked, why did these four men lose their lives and no one would give us an answer? The autopsy report was where it really started clicking that something didn't add up. What they were being told and what we were being told were two different things. Because they know that mission went horribly wrong and it was going to be a lot of fingers to point and to blame. They spent months and months and months trying to formulate a damn story that they thought would protect their ass. The team inaccurately portrayed the first of three total missions on 3 and 4 October. It's all about the club. It's all about circling the wagons around the senior leaders. The Army let me down. They let my son down. And then they lied about it. There he is. Hey, James. Hey, how are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for joining me this morning. I like your background. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, do I say 3212 or what? How do I say this? I, I think uh, 3212 is, is that good? Uh, what we say. I think that it, it depends on who you ask. Yeah. <laughs> it's a reference to the Green Beret team, Operational Detachment 3212. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you for joining me today. It's about your, your eye opening documentary, um, ODA 3212 Green Beret Special Forces Killed in Niger. How did you first hear the story where the Army wasn't being completely truthful about the incident? Well, I covered it with other colleagues at ABC News when it occurred on October 4th, 2017. It was actually went public two days later because one of the soldiers, with David Johnson, was reported missing in action. But it was about six months later, uh, the parents of Jeremiah Johnson contacted me and said that they had some suspicions because they were comparing notes with another family and things did not add up. And they, I soon heard from the other family member, uh, and he was an Afghan war veteran. And he said, you know, what, I, what I'm being told is not what happened, I don't believe. And he welcomed us to you know, investigating it and said that the family would cooperate. The other family that had first contacted me, that stepfather was a retired FBI agent. So it, it wasn't just that from the onset of reporting on this, when it happened, we had, you know, it was clear things were, kind of hinky, you know, even with fog of war considerations, uh, things, you couldn't get the same story from two different officials. But now, six months later, the family members are contacting me, and they're saying that they weren't getting a straight story. And, you know, given their backgrounds, that carried a lot of weight in terms of their level of suspicion. And it turned out, I can say three and a half years later, they were right. They were not told the truth. Well, as an investigative reporter, where would you begin with such a story? Well, I think I always begin with, with, you know, because I've covered national security for, you know, the better part of 25 years, you know, I always go back to uh, the sources that I have and, and I say, well, you know, what do you think happened? Have you heard about this? And, you know, everybody, my inside sources, you know, people I've dealt with for many years were saying, yeah, man, this does not smell right. And the, the more I dug, the more it became apparent that the core story that had been presented by the, the command, by the Pentagon and its investigation made absolutely no sense and was not the truth. Right, you know, we've all seen movies where investigative reporters, especially dealing with the government or the military, anytime you thought you were in danger or people said, you know, leave this alone or, or was it pretty much, uh, you know, you felt safe in what you were doing? Well, I'm a pretty savvy guy and I'm six foot seven and I've been around for a while and I figure, <laughs> you know, if the Taliban didn't get me in Afghanistan, uh, I don't think anybody else is. No, I never had. You're not easy to scare. I mean, <laughs> maybe I was naive. I don't know. But I was really focused on the Pentagon made their findings public 
in May 2018, and the commanding general, the four-star general, General Thomas Waldhauser, who commanded all operations in Africa uh, for the entire military, said that the team that was ambushed had gone, in effect, rogue. They'd gone on an unapproved mission by their senior commanders to hunt down and kill an ISIS commander who was like the number three guy in Africa. And then the second thing he said is they were, the team was incompetent effectively, and they were untrained, unprepared, unskilled, uh, like other special operations teams in Africa. And then the third thing he said that was really eye-popping was he said, but their third of three missions during 24 hours they were outside the wire had involved a search for intelligence on an American who had been kidnapped by Islamist militants a year earlier. And it's like, wait, so they're hunting down a guy and then searching this guy's campsite who they thought was possibly holding an American hostage. How does any of that make sense? It didn't on the face right. of it. And it turned out a lot of it was just garbage. It just wasn't true. And, you know, Afghanistan, Iraq, but Niger, Tongo, Tongo. I mean, Americans never heard of these places. I mean, let alone an incident, right? Yeah, I mean, you had a lot of members of Congress when it happened you know, the White House and President Trump, a lot of people were just like, what? what, we're in Niger? What are we doing in Niger? Where is Niger? And, you know, the reality was we have special operations forces in something like 80 countries fighting ISIS, Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, and so forth. Um, so we'd actually been in Niger for a really long time in the Lake Chad Basin, also in Mali, neighboring Burkina Faso, Nigeria. Um, Somalia, but, yeah. Somalia, yes, yeah. we've gone back to Somalia. 20 plus years after Black Hawk Down, that disaster. So it, it was shocking that this happened, that it was a four hour gunfight and four Americans were killed with David Johnson, Jeremiah Johnson, unrelated, uh, Brian Black and Dustin Wright. But, you know, the question was what happened to them? And I, you know, when a family of, of a fallen soldier says to me, we don't know what happened and we don't think we're being told the truth, that's pretty irresistible to me as, as a journalist, as a human to not, I mean, I just can't say no to somebody like that. And eventually you found out the African command investigated themselves, which is outrageous. You know, the immediate protection of the chain of command of senior leaders, they essentially circled the wagons. They did. And uh, they appointed the chief of staff of the four-star general who commanded Africa command to investigate it. And right there, there was an obvious conflict of interest. They did not examine, uh, Africa Command's own actions or whether they resourced uh, these guys properly. They had no medevac. They had no air support, like combat air support, fighter planes. And when the gunfight happened, French fighter planes showed up. They're not even part of Africa Command. We do work with them, but you know that was not part of any operational planning at all. And they also extracted the team that was ambushed, the survivors. Any trouble getting the families to go on record to speak for this documentary? Almost all of the immediate family members uh, cooperated and also went on camera. And, you know, that really was extraordinary. This is the first time in probably a generation that I can think of where you have essentially all of the immediate family members of all of the troops killed in one combat incident who all have united to say we were lied to. And they were right. They were lied to. They were not presented there, a lot of information was withheld from them, and a lot of things were they were told were, were just simply not true. Yeah, and it's important to get some government and military officials on record, which amazingly you did, but of course some you didn't, uh, but I, they were very forthcoming and uh, angry as well. Yeah, we had the, the top Pentagon official overseeing special operations, Colonel Mark Mitchell, retired, highly decorated Green Beret himself, who went on record to say, to essentially corroborate our ABC News investigation and say, this is what, what the families and the public were told was not what happened. The family should have been told that the ground commander actually objected twice to the missions. Far from going rogue, he actually kept trying to stop these missions from being undertaken, but he was overruled and had to carry them out. You know, and we've all seen it in movies, you know, when the military notifies family, when their soldiers have died, when their, their family has died. Here we see it in person that these, these families telling these stories about being contacted. And I'm telling you, it was heart wrenching. It's a very, you know, it's hard to hear people talk about that knock at the door, or in some cases, a second knock at the door. 
uh, in the case of David Johnson's family, when they found his remains 48 hours after he was missing and uh, reported missing in action. Um, really extraordinarily in the film, his widow also reveals that before she was notified he was dead, they told him, the army told her that he had been captured and the enemy wanted to trade him for a guy in, in a Nigerian prison who was an ISIS guy. And, and 48 that hours later, yeah, but then 48 hours later, they said, no, he's killed in action. I mean, they and just- that's left, yeah. that's left his family with lingering doubt about what happened to him in those 48 hours ever since. Was he captured and executed? That's their worst fear. And they had so many scapegoats in the end, right? People who weren't even there, people who weren't involved, but had to take the fall for to protect the people above them. And we won't know for what, 25 years it's redacted? Has it's been essentially sealed? Yes, that's correct. The uh, Africa Command chose to redact a lot of the information in the report for the, the statutory maximum, what's allowed under the law, which is 25 years. But that's what 3212 Unredacted does in our ABC News film is we, over the course of the feature film 90 Minutes, we strip away the black marks, the redactions of, of things that are hidden and reveal what really happened, the CIA having a role in the mission, you know, whether or not there was any sort of search for intelligence on hostage Jeffrey Woodkey, who is still today a captive of uh, Islamist militants in Africa. And hopefully we offer some answers. So much for transparency, right? <laughs> Amazing. You know, I, this is just a small incident, important as it is, just think of what else that they, they lie about or they, I mean, how do you trust them? when you have something that's that just so obvious on the on the face of it, how contradicting it is. And eye-opening documentary, James, what an incredible job you did. Uh, thank you so much, you know, for your incredible investigating and, and to get the truth. It's all about the truth. So thank you so well, much. thank you. I had great guys, Andy uh, Fredericks and Brian Epstein, who uh, were my co-producers and our great team at ABC News. So we were, I was very blessed to have work with people with a lot of empathy. Uh, 3212 Unredacted, streaming on Hulu, uh, right in time for Veterans Day. Thank you so much, James, and uh, wish you all the best of luck with your documentary. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Take care. Great, Cheers. Jeff. Thank you. Really appreciate it. You bet. Take care. Bye. Bye.